Uh, greetings to all who are following this series of lectures or lessons entitled Gnostic Sabotage in the Book of Revelation. This is John Lash once again. I'm recording on the 12th of December 2012. And the title of this lesson is Special Effects in the Apocalypse. And this would be the second version of the seventh lesson. The reasons for posting two versions, if you want to know, can be found in the disclaimer that is listed along with the talks. So just click on disclaimer and you'll find a brief explanation of why I'm repeating lecture number seven. Uh, it might have crossed your minds that I'm presenting this series of lectures in the days leading up to December 21st, 2012. Of course, the chances are that if you're listening to my words right now, it may be at some point after that date, some weeks, months, or even years later. But looking at what I'm doing right now from the perspective of some future time, you might consider these aspects. You might consider these, uh, these conditions which are surrounding and giving a frame to this set of talks. Because, because regardless of the time lag, uh, these conditions, the cosmic conditions I might call them, of this series of talks will still have a significance and may in fact have a growing significance as time goes by. Some of you may know that a vast uh, complex of factors and claims, suggestions, speculations, and so forth have been associated with December 1st, 2012. By all accounts, it could be considered to be an apocalyptic moment. And uh, no matter what you think about the calculations of the Mayan calendar, personally, I myself don't believe that the accepted end date of December 21, 2012 is correct. I am of the opinion, and I've studied processional timing and sacred calendric systems for 40 years, I'm of the opinion that the date of the end of the Mayan calendar, for what it's worth, of the long count in consideration regarding this phenomenon is in the year 2216, which is 216 years after the year 2000. Anyway, no matter what you may think of that end time reckoning or the ideas of some kind of massive galactic alignment, which, in my opinion, are also uh, wrong, misleading, and astronomically incorrect. It has to be said that the mere fact that so much attention has been directed to this coming moment, nine days ahead of me right now, is in itself a cause of investing meaning in that moment. There is so much anticipation connected to that date that it has built into a meme, to use the uh, vulgar term, it has developed into a meme that is charged with all kinds of significance and all kinds of expectations, good and bad. What I would say about December 21st, 2012, is that it is, in the first place, a solstice moment like so many before it, the moment of the winter solstice occurs around the 21st, 2nd, or 23rd of December annually. And that is, of course, the moment when in the northern hemisphere you have the longest day, longest night, excuse me, and the shortest day, the longest night, that is to say, the period of most intense and prolonged darkness that occurs in the course of the year. And the moment of the winter solstice has been perennially viewed as a moment of descent into the depths, into darkness, which is not necessarily and certainly ought not be considered as a descent into, into something evil, but into the darkness, as it were, of, 
of loam, of soil, of the darkness of the earth. And out of that darkness, which is deeply fertile and which contains the seeds of new birth, a rebirth and regeneration process unfolds. And the winter solstice has always been celebrated uh, over many centuries in the past with that theme in mind, regeneration. So, to use the old cliche, the moment of the winter solstice is the darkness before the dawn. And this winter solstice is just the same as many others that have preceded it. But in one respect, it may also be unique. It may really be the winter solstice at the beginning of the 20th century that marks a moment unlike any other, unlike any preceding centuries, that marks a moment that determines the course of humanity for the next 204 years until the end of this kalpa, the end of this great processional cycle of 25,920 years. So this is both a solstice moment like all others preceding it, and this is also unique, a unique solstice moment. And I would venture to call it the moment of deepest darkness for humanity, the moment of a very particular challenge. How and why that has come to be associated with galactic alignment and various ancient calendric systems is, I believe, largely irrelevant. I find, and I'm an expert in these matters, that most of those associations, mythological, cultural, and astronomical, are erroneous. We can actually cast them aside. Whatever has brought the attention of humanity and of certain individuals, such as you hearing my words now, to this moment, the challenge is to see the moment for what it is and to see the opportunity it presents. And I would call the winter solstice of December 2012 humanity's darkest moment. Now when I say darkest, I don't mean a bad moment or an evil moment. I've made it clear in the past that there's nothing evil about darkness. There is a particular glitch in human thinking and it is like a bad stain that spreads itself through the whole field of human thought and inquiry. And that is the association of darkness with evil. This is completely erroneous. The problem with evil is not darkness, but secrecy. Because evil can only operate through secrecy and deceit. So the problem facing humanity at its darkest moment is facing the ultimate secrecy and deceit operating on this planet Earth. The ultimate secrecy and deceit that is in some manner threatening the very existence of the human species on Earth and threatening the environment itself, although I would not go so far as to say that the earth, the planet earth could be destroyed by this threat, certainly not. But it is most definitely a threat to the way that I would like to live, which is to say peacefully, happily, to thrive, to enjoy myself and other people and not to be interfered with by the authorities and not to be under the threats of uh, war and social disorder as occurs today constantly in all countries around the world. So to speak in a new, with a little bit of a new age pitter-patter, sure, a safe, happy, and harmonious world. I mean, why not? Why isn't it that way? It isn't that way not because the powers of darkness are operating in our midst, not because there is some cosmic principle of evil operating against humanity, although there is an evil of sorts, but because certain human beings operate in secrecy and deceit 
against other human beings. And that is the evil. The evil is in human behavior, human actions conceived, planned, and executed in secrecy, not in darkness. So I ask you to consider that and to clear your minds of that persistent and extremely unfortunate glitch concerning darkness. Just because darkness provides cover for someone to do something that you can't see and therefore gives them a certain power and advantage over you, it's not the fault of the darkness. It's the fault of the motive of the person operating in the darkness. And I would just like to give you something to chew on or to put it less crudely, if I might offer you a little drop of elixir for your brain. And I guarantee you that you have never, ever before heard anything like what I'm going to say right now. And it's simple. What I have to say is really simple. So here it is. If you believe there are demonic forces operating on this planet that are harmful to humanity, then you need to know that the one place where those forces, those demons, cannot hide is in darkness. Demons cannot hide in darkness. Have you ever heard that said before? Now, naturally, you're going to ask, as that little drop of elixir filters into your brain, you're going to ask, well, where can demons hide? Well, demons hide right out in the open. You see, that's the problem. That's the problem. Is that the acts of evil and destruction that spread across this planet and spread through human society right down into the personal lives of every single individual in the world, those evil actions which are performed in secrecy and deceit are enacted right out in the open. They are right out in the open. And so the demonic theater of horror facing humanity at its darkest moment is right out in the open because demonic forces and people who are acting demonically because they are insane and infected like rabid animals with a destructive madness and a lust to kill, those human beings enact their wicked deeds right out in the open. So demonic forces actually hide in the open. But when they are encountered in the darkness, they cannot hide. Think about this. Because this is a strategy that I offer to you, speaking as a Latter-day Gnostic or a Telestis, I offer you, for your consideration, this strategy of psychic warfare. Are you willing to stand now with the human race, with all that lives on the earth, all that is good and beautiful and sweet and kind, all that just wants to live and thrive and enjoy? If you stand with that against the demonic destruction and murderous deceit that is operating in our world, then you are ready to stand on the line at humanity's darkest moment. And in December 1st, 2012, I ask you if you can do something. Step across that line and step into darkness. Because only if you are able to face darkness and step into darkness will you be able to meet and master the demonic powers. Because when you step into darkness, or to put it in Jungian psychological terms, when you own the darkness, 
that is in yourself, which is not evil, but the power of darkness, then through that recognition, you can defeat, you can detect and defeat demonic forces because demonic forces operating on this planet cannot hide in darkness. To put this another way, which relates closely to the language that I use in my teaching of planetary tantra, I'll introduce the word infernal. Now, I'd like you to consider, as I, can, as I continue with these talks on the apocalypse, that the word infernal might not be as you have previously considered it. What conventionally and uh, normally speaking does the word infernal suggest? Hell, the infernal region, the inferno, the place inside the earth or the place in some deep dark abyss, the bottomless pit, the infernal regions full of demons, the infernal region, the habitation of the devil, of Satan, on, on, and on, and on. All this is entirely wrong. And I'm telling you, as one individual talking to another, that if you cannot clear your mind out of the, out of the brainwashing and the effects of centuries of mind control that give you an erroneous notion of darkness and infernal regions, you will be the victim of those demonic forces. One of the essential tools of psychic warfare against the black magic psychic warfare, if you will, that is operating in this world, one of the essential weapons or strategies against that is to completely change your concept and your sense and your relation to what is infernal. So I'm going to give you a new definition of what is infernal. It's very simple. Infernal, think internal. Think internal. Take the word infernal and correct one letter and call it internal. And then say to yourself, in this moment of challenge, the darkest moment of humanity, I step across the line and I assume the internal powers. I assume the internal powers upon myself. I assume the infernal powers. I assume the infernal powers upon myself. It's the same thing. And where are these internal slash infernal powers? They're right under your feet. They are the powers that reside in the material body of the earth, of the planet. So, you look at the earth around you, you imagine the, the massive round globe of this planet, and you think in this way. Contained within the material globe of the planet earth are supernatural and spiritual forces belonging to the earth, belonging to the living superorganism, Gaia. And those are the internal, infernal powers of the planetary mother animal. And they are yours for the taking. And with the recognition of that internal power of the earth, that it is alive and that it is more than alive. It is infinite. It is an infinite matrix of super life and animation and joy and delight and wisdom and transformation and magic and illumination and ecstasy. It is the source and matrix of all that, the infernal power of Gaia. And when you connect to that, and make a relationship to that, it becomes your power. You become an instrument of that power. You become a handler of the power of the great beast. 
And this is the moment to make that choice. And everyone who hears my words, which are words that have never been spoken before, which are matters that have never been elucidated in this manner ever before by anyone, when you hear them in the weeks and months to come, know that I put to you a challenge. And it is as clear as dark and light. You work with both. You need to detect the demons operating right in front of your face, the people who are lying to humanity right in the face of the world, who lie to your face constantly. These deceivers are using secrecy and deception to wreak havoc and evil and destruction. You face them in the light of day and you draw upon the power of darkness to defeat those demons because the demons, when they are sucked up by the darkness, when the darkness comes to them and overcomes them, they are exposed. They are exposed. No demon can hide in darkness. That is a Gnostic saying. I realize that it's extremely paradoxical what I'm saying to you. But in the spin of that paradox, there is liberation. There is illumination. The true illuminati, that is to say, the enlightened human animal connected to the mother source and living in the light of consciousness, embraces that paradox. And as you allow yourself to do that, I assure you that that paradox of light and darkness, as I've just elucidated it, has a spin about it. It spins like a top in your mind, doesn't it? And that spin will take you out of the cognitive dissidence in which the human race has been plunged for many, many centuries now. Cognitive dissonance is the sign and symptom that you are in mind control, that you are under an assault of mind control or of mental black magic, if you will. The event of 9-11 produced in the entire world a massive seizure of cognitive dissonance. The deceivers and evil, destructive psychopaths who planned and executed that event, they are just human beings, by the way, but they have what you might say a demonic level of insanity. Their, their, their human insanity has made them to seem superhumanly demonic. Okay, those perpetrators not only committed an act of destruction on that day that took the lives of people and that destroyed buildings, but even more so, they perpetrated an act of mental warfare, psychological warfare of the most massive scope an act of psychological warfare of tremendous impact. And the whole of humanity on this planet has been in an even deeper, was, was pushed into an even deeper into cognitive dissonance by that event. It was the master coup of the planetary psychopathic predators. And in order to overcome the evil that is now operating on this planet, which has been given a license and a, a, a huge scope of opportunity through 9-11, that evil destructive magic has to be met by counter magic. I ask you to consider the term counter magic. If there's anything that you take away from my talks on the apocalypse, be it something so mild as a niche in your scalp, then let it be this. 
you realize that the apocalypse does not have to be decoded symbol by symbol and line by line. That in itself would lead to a kind of dissociative insanity or else it would lead you down so many rabbit holes that you would never find your way back to the breakfast table to eat a piece of toast. Nor does it have to be interpreted as it has been in the so-called dispensationist tradition as prophetic prediction of historical events. You know, the rise of the Roman Empire, the great horror of Babylon is the Catholic Church, the seven hills of the seven... No, 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 no. Forget about the historical analysis. Forget about the meticulous decoding, which uh, receives a lot of in- attention from self-appointed spiritual gurus today who would ask you to give you, ask you for your time and your money to listen to them expound endlessly and show off to you how well they can handle esoteric symbolism. Blow it all off. Blow it off. There is no more time for this baggage. The moment of challenge is here. The solstice of 2012 is humanity's darkest moment, which is to say, the moment to claim the infernal power that allows each one of us to face and break the lie, the great, great lie. There is a great lie operating on this planet. And that lie may be compared to the mythological animal of the hydra. That is to say, a kind of serpent with many heads. And each time you whack off one of those heads, it grows several more. The lie is hinted in certain words, such as conspiracy. Breaking through this lie requires that you operate as a warrior and that you are able to perform psychological warfare yourself. How about that? Stop being concerned about the psychological warfare that's being perpetrated on you And start practicing some of your own. This study course in the book of Apocalypse could lead to that opportunity. It could lead to that strategy. So just bear in mind, as you're scratching your scalp and walking away from these lectures, that if there is a counter magic to the evil and deceptive magic operating against you, you had better find out what it is. Because exposing the evil and deceptive counter magic of the planetary psychopaths and the intraspecies predators, as I call them, is not enough. It is not enough. That is only working with the light. That is seeing in the light of day Who is lying in the banking system, in the political system, in religion, in pharmacology, in medicine, in the media? To see who is lying and why they are lying and what their agendas are. They're all out in the open. They're all hiding out in the open. These lies and acts of deception are perpetrated right in your face, flagrantly, blatantly. But seeing that is only half of it. Because you can see all that after listening to David Icke lecture nonstop for seven hours. You could probably see a lot of that. But where do you get the power and the strategy to defeat what you see? You get it from the infernal, internal regions. And so... The book of the apocalypse does not have to be understood today as anything but an agenda that shows the power of the planetary animal mother, her infernal feminine energies rising up against the insanity of the perpetrator God, the master demon of the human mind, the almighty off-planet creator. That's the battle 
seen in the apocalypse. That's the battle that you are in. And the only value of investigating the apocalypse today, according to the frame that I'm offering you, is that it gives you a knowledge of where you stand and leads you to the strategy of counter magic. The fate of humanity on this planet depends on magic. It is magic that is working against the human race and so likewise magic working for the human race is the proper adversary and we are all engaged in a magical war. I intend that my interpretation of apocalypse, that my disclosure of the Gnostic sabotage, as I call it in the book of Revelation, stands for weeks, months, and years after I record these words. It stands as the foundation of the strategy of psychological warfare for the liberation, freedom, and happiness of this planet. That's my commitment to you. Now, in the second half of this makeover of Talk 7, I'd like to address a few points of objection that could be raised to my treatment so far. As you know, I've taken a special position. I've, I, I'm, I have a method of handling the material of the book of Revelation, obviously, that is different from the way it has been handled before. One reason why the method is different is because the handler, if I might use that term, or the person giving the exposition of the method is not a Christian and not a Jew and not a New Age person and not a member of uh, the Islamic religion and not an advocate of Hinduism and not an advocate of Taoism or even of the indigenous spiritualities of the world. No, you're getting it from the horse's mouth. You're getting it from a Gnostic, a Telestis. And so that is a completely different origin of commentary and a completely different method of deconstruction and interpretation of the contents. Now, one of the features stated at the outset of my approach is to indicate that there are certain elements in the book of Revelation, most specifically in chapter 13 and chapter 17, which can be regarded as odd, incongruous, anomalous, bizarre, however you want to put it. What I am developing is a view of Revelation that recognizes that some parts of the book are not necessarily part of the vision that John of Patmos, if he indeed were the author, would have produced by himself. And so I've made the claim that even though The book of Revelation, as everyone knows, who's ever studied it uh, from a scholarly point of view, even though the book of Revelation uh, derives from and relies heavily on Jewish apocalypticism, uh, there are elements in it that cannot be fitted to that origin. Well, I'm sure that there are many Christians out there. I know that there are many uh, devoted Christians putting clips on YouTube and discussing with great uh, learning and with great passion the matters of the apocalypse and the Antichrist and the end of the world scenario in the book of Revelation. And many of them are deeply versed in scripture and would be delighted to tear me apart, critically speaking, because I am not citing chapter and verse because I am not going through the Bible with a fine tooth comb 
and meticulously picking and arguing every point. And I'm not going to do that because it's not necessary and there isn't enough time. But I would refer to one precedent in the Old Testament that leads directly to the language and imagery of the book of Revelation. I said that the appearance of the great beast in chapter 13, the beast that rises out of the sea with seven heads and ten horns, is an anomaly and does not derive logically or automatically or archetypally from previous versions of the apocalypse in Judaism. Well, of course, that's not exactly the case. So I refer you to Daniel book 7 in the Old Testament. And it goes like this. In the first year of Belshazzar, king of Babylon, Daniel had a dream and visions of his head upon his bed. Then he wrote the dream and told us some of the matters. Daniel spake and said, I saw in my vision by night, and behold, the four winds of the heaven strove upon the great sea. And four great beasts came up from the sea, diverse one from the other. Note that phrase, diverse one from the other. The first was like a lion and had eagle's wings. I beheld till the wings thereof were plucked, and it was lifted up from the earth and made stand upon the feet as a man, and a man's heart was given to all. And behold, another beast, a second, like to a bear, and it raised up itself on one side, and it had three ribs in the mouth of it, between the teeth of it. And they said thus unto it, Arise, devour much flesh. And after this I beheld, and lo, another, like a leopard, which had upon the back of it four wings of a fowl. The beast had also four heads, and the dominion was given to it. After this I saw in the night visions, and behold, a fourth beast, dreadful and terrible, and strong exceeding, and it had great iron teeth, it devoured and brake in pieces, and stamped the residue with the feet of it, and it was diverse from all the beasts that were before it, and it had ten horns. Verses 1 through 7 of chapter 7 of the book of Daniel. So you might say from that description, well, wait a minute here, John. How can you say that the appearance of the great beast in the book of Revelation is some anomaly that may have even been planted in, in the mind of the author by other people when there is a clear precedent of it in the book of Daniel. Okay. I would answer that objection in this way. The whole field of apocalyptic literature in the Judeo-Christian tradition consists of a number of Vibrant images, which Swiss psychologist C.G. Jung called archetypes. So these are images of animal powers and sometimes of angelic powers and sometimes reptilian or serpent powers. For instance, uh, the Leviathan and the Behemoth of the Old Testament have been compared by some scholars to the greater beast and the lesser beast of Revelation. What Actually, you have here are just materials of human imagination. Now, it's a matter of argument if those materials come out of a sick and demented mentality, that is to say as delusions and hallucinations, or whether they are indications of actual genuine spiritual vision. Regardless of which they are, they can be included under the definition of archetypes. And so these archetypes, the angelic figures, the the reptilian or dragon figures, either in the sky or in the earth, and the various monstrous beasts with horns and teeth, are all archetypal figures, and they are the stock figures of the apocalyptic tradition. So they're bound to appear all through the Bible, Old and New Testament, and reappear in different versions. It's as if you had the props and the set pieces used to do the film Alien by Ridley Scott. Well, we know that there was not just the first film Alien, which occurs on an advanced spacecraft and has the monstrous alien creature. These are props. But we have Alien 2, Alien 3. Likewise, say, with a 
with Batman. The Batman film has a number of versions, and it's known to Hollywood insiders that when a film is made and it is projected to go into Batman 1, 2, 3, Superman 1, 2, 3, Spider-Man 1, 2, 3, that the accountants go to work on the costs of the properties for making those films and that the same properties are used relatively with some changes, but the same properties and sets are used in each film. And the cost of the film is calculated according to the, uh, I think it's called the amortization of the value of the properties. So when Batman 1 was made, the properties were extremely expensive, but because they were able to be used again in Batman 2, they were less expensive and so on. Well, it's the same thing. The setting and properties of apocalypticism are reused by different generations. The key to seeing the difference, the key to seeing what is different and what is perhaps anomalous or incongruous is in how they are used. And if you read carefully those first seven verses in the book of Daniel, you'll see that Daniel uses those props of the animals, the bear, the leopard, and the lion, which appear in Revelation 13, in a certain manner. Uh, He elaborately goes into them and describes different aspects of them, uh, uh, and they they undergo uh, a kind of metamorphosis. They sprout wings. Their teeth are described. Various details are described. But none of this is described regarding the great beast. And most importantly, regarding chapter 7 of Daniel is the second or third verse where he says, and four great beasts came up from the sea, diverse one from another. The difference in the great beast in chapter 13 of Revelation is that it is a composite that is an integral and integrated matrix. It does not fall apart. It is not a modular archetype. It is an integral archetype. And this is a really big difference. It may sound like scholarly squabbling, but I assure you it is not. The great beast of the apocalypse, which comes up out of the sea like the four beasts of Daniel, is a single entity, a single matrix of animal powers. And also, equally so, it does not... operate by breaking out into modular functions as Daniel's beasts are seen to do. It remains intact and it operates as a single entity. But then there is even another difference, which is that due to the appearance of the second beast, we understand that the first beast cannot really operate on its own power. It needs a handler. Now, if you go back and read Daniel's revelation of the four beasts, they don't need handlers. Those beasts operate out of their own power, and there is not a secondary and related entity who appears in specific relation to them. That is what is really unique about the two beasts in the book of Revelation. The, and the dynamic relation between those two beasts is a unique content of the book of Revelation. The the collaboration, as it were, or cooperation, the powers that the great beast confers on the handler, the powers that the handler derives from the great beast, all of that is completely unique in the monstrous composite of Tomegatherian. So even though you might look back at the Revelation of Daniel, and see the same archetypal components, the manifestation of the power of the beast in Revelation is entirely different. And I submit to you that the more you look at it, the more you investigate it, the more different it appears to be. Also, there is no question in previous apocalyptic scenarios that any of the beasts or bestial or monstrous figures 
serpentile or satanic figures, call them what you will, that any of them really poses any great challenge to the plan and power of the Almighty Father God. What do these beasts do? Well, in the apocalyptic tradition, of course, they represent powers that oppose uh, the, the faith of the Jewish people or powers that oppose the mission of the Jews, of the ancient Hebrews. And it is only when Jewish apocalyptic scenarios have been taken up and worked over in the Christian fold do they become, do they uh, come to operate on another scale? That is to say, the, the threat arises that is a real and ultimate threat to the power of the Father God. So the four beasts of Daniel may represent heresies, they may represent corrupt kingdoms and theocracies of the Middle East and or they may represent particular individuals of that time. I mean, all this has been analyzed in absolutely excruciating detail. Uh, and I've read uh, many, many books on the subject and incorporated a good deal of that research into my book, Not in His Image. Uh, I refer you again to uh, Apocalypticism in the Dead Sea Scrolls by John J. Collins, if you want to have your head spinning for a few weeks. Dig into that. And even though all those elements have been considered, the danger posed by the bestial and monstrous and satanic figures in Hebrew tradition cannot be compared in terms of its power and its danger to that of the great beast of Revelation. Uh, the magnificent message, and if I may say so, the magnificent opportunity presented by the great beast of Revelation is the opportunity to consider if there could be some kind of power that could actually defeat the plan of the Almighty. And I propose to you that there is such a power and that power is accessible to you as a human being if you would like to become a quote satanic unquote agent. Do you want to become a satanic agent? Well, if you want to come, become a satanic agent you simply must ask yourself what you would be fighting against because satanic simply means that which is adversarial. So are you adversarial to something? Do you want to be adversarial to something? Give you a concrete example. Would you, do you want to be adversarial to the, to, to the crime and disease of pedophilia that's rampant in this world? Do you take an adversarial or satanic position toward pedophilia? Do you take a satanic or adversarial position toward corruption in the government, toward the use of predator drones? And on and on and on. Ask yourself a hundred of those questions of what you take an adversarial position to. You might recall that in my book, The Hero, Manhood and Power, I said the hero is defined by what he or she stands up against. So what do you stand up against? And after you've gone through a list of 20 or 50 or 100 things that you stand up against, ask yourself this. Are you ready to stand up against the Almighty God and the plan and agenda of the Almighty God as described in the scenario of the Bible? That is to say, an agenda of genocide, destruction, retribution, damnation, destruction of the earth, torture of human beings, and deliverance of the blessed ones into the bosom of the Almighty Father. Are you willing to stand against that, ready, willing, and able to stand against that. Because what does it mean to stand against the Almighty Father God? It doesn't really mean to be against God, conceived as the absolute creator of the universe. It means to be against the God who presumes to be creator, the pretender God, whom the Gnostics called Yaldabaoth, and to stand against the pretender God, and what is the way to take the stand against the pretender God? 
It is to take a stand against his narrative. Because in fact, and here is a secret of the tactical operations of counter magic. In fact, to destroy the narrative and defeat the narrative is actually the greater part of the battle. So if you stand against the narrative of the book of Revelation, then you are actually standing against the presumed almighty Father God who is attributed as the author of the events described in that book. And yes, you are standing against Jesus Christ, the Messiah, and the Archangel Michael, and the 24 elders around the throne, and you're even standing against the Lamb of God. And I have to tell you that if you're going to stand against the Lamb of God, then it might be a good idea to have some other supreme value to hold in your heart that would replace the value of the Lamb of God. You know, the Lamb of God is associated, of course, with Jesus Christ in Christian theology and Christian apocalypticism. Jews, of course, reject Jesus Christ as the Messiah. And the Lamb of God, as it appears in the book of Revelation, can actually be regarded as a weapon of psychological warfare against your mind. Remember that I said earlier that when you are in cognitive dissonance, confused and unable to act, unable to detect who the players are, unable to see the deceit and destruction that is flagrantly displayed before your eyes, when you're in that unfortunate state, It means that you are seized by a a psychic attack. You are engaged in mental warfare, or more exactly, more accurately, someone is perpetrating an onslaught of psychological warfare on you. The Lamb of God is a tool for such warfare because... It contains a melding of two themes that you cannot possibly associate in your mind, but you are forced to associate. One of them is the theme of innocence. In some respect, of course, the Lamb of God represents the innocence of Jesus Christ the Messiah. But since Jesus Christ the Messiah came to be embodied as a human being and can be regarded and usually is regarded as the most perfect and innocent human being that ever lived, a human slash divine being, then the inference is that the Lamb of God represents the ultimate and supreme innocence of humanity itself, the sinlessness of humanity. So the Lamb of God imagery or archetype or icon plants in your mind the suggestion of a supreme spiritual innocence of humanity. And since you are a member of humanity, that innocence extends to you. Therefore, people have seen the Lamb of God in that respect and have embraced it as an icon of human innocence. However, at the same time that the value of innocence is implanted in your mind by that image, so is another value, which is to say fear and terror at the retribution to be executed by the Lamb of God upon those who are sinners. And since we are all sinners in the biblical scenario, you're caught in a jam. You see the Lamb of God as the touchstone of your innocence, a supreme and transcendent kind of innocence imbued in the entire human species, if you will. You see it as a touchstone 
to that innocence and at the same time you see it as the weapon of terror that will inflict retribution on you because in some way you have betrayed that innocence. The message of cognitive dissonance in the book of Revelation is that it gives you a hint of your innocence and then condemns you for not being faithful to that, inf- that innocence. I don't know, how would you put it? Condemns you for what? Condemns you for sin. But the Lamb of God is sinless. The sinless power is the instrument of punishing sin. That is a proposition of huge cognitive dissonance. Because it assumes and it asks you to believe and forces you to believe that the supreme power of innocence would harm anyone. But the very nature of innocence is that it does no harm. So can you see how countless human beings through history for centuries have been trapped in a cognitive dissonance that is encoded in these archetypal religious allegories and images. And someone who might have met John of Patmos at that time would have known that he himself was trapped in this cognitive dissonance of his own visions and his own conflicted understanding of the divine plan, divine sacrifice, and the final retribution of the Father God. And so if if the person or persons encountering the author of Revelation had compassion for him and they had insight into what he said, they might have attempted to give him something, to give him some psychological medicine and some spiritual counseling, if you will, that would have helped him deal with his cognitive dissonance and the torture of his terrorized mind. What I seek to get across to you, and this again is the unique feature of my approach to the book of Revelation, is that the way to understand this document is to see that it contains its own sabotage. But the sabotage is the freedom from the terror and self-torture inflicted by the apocalyptic scenario. Anyone who takes on the apocalyptic scenario as a prophecy from divinely illuminated sources that must be fulfilled at the end of history is buying into a nightmare. This is a nasty, nasty ending. And there is massive genocide and vicious murder and retribution and poisoning in the scenario of doomsday. If you buy into that scenario through your beliefs in the Bible and in the power of God in his son, then you are bound to be tortured by that scenario. But I submit to you that the Gnostic sabotage is the way to be released from that torture. And that it's not something that I'm inventing in order to help you extricate yourself from the, the terrorist nightmare of the apocalypse. No. It's something that I am inviting you to discover through my mythological deconstruction of the content of that document. That's all. The way out of the preordained terror and horror of the final solution of the apocalypse is the breaking out of the narrative a breaking away from the narrative. And the factors that would allow you today, 2,000 years after it was written, that would allow you to break out of the paranoid terror of that scenario are actually contained in the scenario. That is the Gnostic sabotage. 
of the book of Revelation. So having said that, I come to an hour in the second version of the seventh talk, and I'd just like to wind up in the remaining 10 minutes with a summary of those special effects again. And I'm going to just categorize them in five items. I'm going to give you a bullet list of five items. Just to remind you, I'll return again and again to the matter of the so-called special effects in the remaining talks. But for right now, here you go. One, in the pagan apocalypse, there would be a sexual awakening of the human race. There would be an awakening to the innocence and purity of the body and to the life of the body, including its sexual and sensual capacities, including the capacity for pleasure and delight and play, such as we see in children and also in animals, all young animals play, otters, beavers, lions. The play of the animal life of the planet would be released, the play power would be released, and that would be one of the special effects produced by rapture, seizure by the powers of the great beast. To be in rapture before the planetary animal mother means to be seized by the power of Tomegotherian. And in that seizure is ecstasy and awe and releasement of all that is beautiful and pleasurable in human capacities. Second effect. Reread chapter 13 and reread those lines that describe how the world is affected by the appearance of the great beast. And then again, those lines describing the powers that the lesser beast draws from the great beast. These include signs and wonders. So there would be magic. There is magic from access to the infernal powers of the earth. This is the message contained in the Gnostic content of the book of Revelation. And St. John of Patmos, or whoever he was, whatever Christian fanatic who wrote this, or, or whatever team of monks who put this together, I can guarantee you that they most certainly did not like to be in touch with the infernal powers of the earth. Although this was written in a cave where there was actually an infernal head of a demonic kind formed out of the deposits in that cave. The setting in which it, this was written says a lot about the state of mind of the team of monks who put it together. And the last thing that they would ever experience in their life as Christians is surrender to the infernal powers of the earth that is of nature. Why? Because nature worship is a pagan thing. Nature worship is a pagan attitude. Awe in front of the earth, of the sky, of the water. The perception that nature is alive. This is a pagan view of life. They were not pagans. They were against surrender to the natural forces. They would have considered that to be a submission to demonic powers. And so, wonder at the power of nature and miraculous moments in communion with nature would have been horrors to them. And hatred of the animal world or theriophobia was, as is well known, a common and widespread trait among early Christians. Number three, blasphemies. Blasphemies spill off the great beast like, like an aroma spilling off a mountain lion. Imagine walking by a mountain lion and smelling the aroma of that animal, especially if it had just had a meal and it still had blood and sinews in its jaws. Just imagine smelling the 
powerful aromas proceeding from a magnificent predatory animal like a mountain lion. Blasphemies pour from the great beast like the aroma of the beast. What are these blasphemies? Well, how do you define blasphemy? You know? Blasphemy can only be defined by a framework in which some things are taboos. For instance, it is taboo to say that, that uh, Jesus was not the Son of God. That's a blasphemy. If I didn't, or if I say that he was, you know, a, a queer, that's a blasphemy. If I say that he and John the Baptist were queers, that's a blasphemy. If I say that uh, Jesus invented pizza, you know, that's a blasphemy. And that's what he served at the Last Supper, you know. Uh, blasphemy is something that offends believers. So by saying those things, by making statements contrary to the theological assumptions of Christianity, or by making derogatory and insulting and ridiculing remarks about the main players in the Judeo-Christian tradition, be they Moses or Jesus, I am committing blasphemy. But blasphemy is relative to, to the definition of what is sacred. So I would ask you this. Anybody could commit blasphemy against Judaism, Christianity, or Islam, especially Islam. If you draw a cartoon of Mohammed, you're committing blasphemy. Why? Because those three religions have set up a, a rigorous and rigid set of norms by which they define that which is sacred to them. And if another human being comes along and either intentionally or non-intentionally violates any of those norms, then they are accused of blasphemy. And in some respects, uh, they'll come after you and kill you for blasphemy. So I'm going to propose to you this question. What would you say about a religious or spiritual system, if you will, let's just call it a system, a religious or spiritual system in which blasphemy is not possible? Think about that. Now, I'm presenting these talks from a Gnostical point of view. I'm speaking from the position of those who lost the war of history that began with the rise of Christianity. And I'm saying to you, okay, I'm a Gnostic. This is what I follow, the story of the divine Sophia and the Sophia narrative, sacred narrative of the mysteries. And these are some of the premises and propositions of Gnosticism. And now let me see you commit blasphemy against that. And guess what? <laughs> you can't do it. You see, there's no way to commit blasphemy against Gnosticism. And no Gnostic or Telestus would ever in any way be offended. A Telestus would object to your stupidity. A, a Telestus would refute your idiotic notions of good and evil and God and nature and what is sacred and what is not sacred. A Telestus would mock you for your willful oblivion, for instance, about the nature of paganism, but would never take anything as a blasphemy. It is impossible to blaspheme the Sophianic vision of the mysteries. It is impossible to blaspheme the organic light. So I ask you, if you had your choice, you know, most people do not select the religion to which they belong. As I said in Not in His Image, Christianity is a, rigid, a religion, is a faith embraced by billions, but rarely chosen by anyone. Okay, same for Islam, same for Hinduism. So if you want to choose, think about choosing a religion or a spiritual framework in which there can be no blasphemy. I prefer to use the word taboo. And in future talks, I'm going to talk about the role of taboo breaking. So what I propose to you is that this horrible wave of stinking blasphemies that is proceeding from the great beast is simply a wave of taboo-breaking perceptions and assertions. 
to break all the taboos, all the taboos of all religions is a sign of someone living in the pagan apocalypse. So, sexual illumination, one. The wonders of nature, two. Three, blasphemies or taboo-breaking statements and perceptions. Four, the special effects that I described, which are the powers or capacities in a magical sense acquired by the lesser beast as handler of the, of the forces of the greater beast. And you can go and read what they are. The capacity to uh, kill is one of them, to kill by magic, and to construct an icon or mandala representing the 18 powers of the great beast in such a manner that that icon itself becomes a source of power, becomes an instrument of magic and wisdom. Five, I haven't got to this yet, uh, the seals. You could say that just as the forces of the Almighty Father God have weapons of mass destruction, which are discharged by angels who open the seals, there is a counter magic of seals. Just as each of the seven angels can discharge a vial of wrath and pollution and genocidal murderous infection upon the earth for the delight of the Father God and the Son and the Lamb of God, so the opposing forces can release their own weapons of mass delight, weapons of mass deconstruction, weapons of liberation. And there are, I submit for your consideration, 18 seals, 18 seals, 6 plus 6 plus 6 in the counter magic of the planetary animal mother. So already that's good news, isn't it? Because it means the, the Almighty Father God is discharging his horrific and terrifying force of retribution through seven seals. But the opposing forces really have him outgunned because they have 18. Okay, finally, as point six of special effects, I would refer you to the mysterious matter of that which is white and soft and fluffy and comes up out of the earth. Now, someone wrote me upon hearing the first version of talk seven and said, it sounds like mushrooms to me. And that is, of course, one answer. Now, that does not mean that I'm talking to you here in a coy and suggestive way and hiding my agenda but trying to insinuate it to you in a sly manner. That is to say that I am proposing that I am a Gnostic guru at the head of some kind of mushroom cult and I'm sucking you into it all through the series of lectures that I'm giving. That is not the case at all. If anyone wants to know how I feel about mushrooms as psychoactive plants and sacred teacher plants, go read Psychonautics in, not in, in, uh, on metahistory.org and go read about the Eleusinian mysteries in my book, Not in His Image. That is my position on the psychoactive powers of mushrooms. So the mycelial blanket of mushrooms and the fruiting bodies corresponds to something white and soft and fluffy and lamb-like that comes out of the ground. But that's only one answer. The second part of that answer remains to be disclosed. And the second part of that answer is one of the supreme special effects in the book of Revelation. It is the special effect that gives the, uh, that gives authority to the handler of the great beast. And in future talks, 
will return to the question of what, just what exactly that is.